Boardroom Bound, episode 152, Marketing Yourself to Your Network with Rahul Mirren. We also help people to understand that in order to get a board seat, one of the most important things you need to do is make sure your network knows that you want a board seat. If people don't know that you want a board seat, then they may not know to think of you. Then you need to make their target even easier for them to see. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Boardroom Bound. My name is Alexander Lowry, and this is the podcast dedicated to intentional leadership in the boardroom. My goal is to give aspiring and existing directors the tips, tactics, and strategies necessary to transform your confidence and build a successful career as a board director. Quick reminder, you can get all of today's show notes at podcast.gordon.edu. And in today's episode, we're speaking with Rahul Marani. And Rahul is both the president of the Board of Directors Center of Excellence and also the CEO of the CFO's Domain. Both of those touch on the boardroom space about educating, preparing people to be good at their jobs, being good at the boardroom. And we're going to hear not only about those organizations, about how they're helping in this space, but also what he's doing in his own personal life and the boards that he is on and the decisions he is making as he thinks about his portfolio professional board career that he's building up in parallel. Before we jump into today's show, I'd like to share a message from our sponsor about director certification. Want to join your first board or are you looking for additional board seat opportunities? In either scenario, be sure to be disciplined in your approach. Now through the Becoming an Exceptional Board Director Candidate Coaching and Certification course, you get both modern board director candidate packaging and modern board operations knowledge integrated within one program. Remember the key to landing additional or your first board seat is in your packaging. Make the effort to do it right. Program graduates also receive their globally recognized International Board Director Competency designation upon course completion. It's designed for individuals and groups. You can learn more at bit.ly slash IBDC D. That's bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash IBC D. And now let's jump into the show. Rahul Marani, welcome to the Boardroom Bound Podcast. Alexander, thanks for having me. Well, this is great fun, and it is a small world after all, as you sit on your side of the country and I sit on mine, and we're going to talk as friends and sharing the different stories that you've got, because there's so much that you do, both uh, personally and professionally related to the board stuff. I'm excited to bring your audience in to hear how those different parts interact and the way it goes, but I get so excited. Before I jump in and start dissecting that and, and sharing with our audience, give us a bit of a career trajectory about how you got to where you are and all the various things you've got going on today. And again, thank you for having me on the show. It's, uh, it's a fantastic uh, production, and I'm glad to be a part of it. So I, I grew up in Sydney, Australia, and was born and bred there. I happened to spend a couple of months every year growing up traveling to, uh, to India, where my grandparents were, which was a, a, an important part of sort of my, my development and, and in understanding some of the things I'm doing today that made an impact on my life. So I'll come back to that. So grew up there. I went to school, went to university. I went to the University of Technology, Sydney. I studied a Bachelor of Business with majors in accounting and finance. From there, I was recruited into PricewaterhouseCoopers, where I joined the corporate finance and recovery team and spent a couple of years in and around corporate finance, M&A, valuation, investment banking, before deciding to travel to London for a opportunity with a, another bank, investment bank, a uh, well-known investment bank, and took six months off prior to that to spend in Banff, Canada, actually, in the ski fields with uh, a few dear friends of mine. So often Australians will, will take a bit of a gap year here right. and there, and I'd work straight from high school to university to the you know, corporate uh, uh, world, and I, I wanted to take some time to sort of pause and, and think a little bit more about what I was doing and enjoy my time. So... When I landed up in Canada, there happened to be a young lady who I'd known from earlier on in life that lived in California, and I came to visit her, and she came to visit me, and then I, again, returned to visit her, and by the way, this, this young lady is now my wife, <laughs> mother of my two children, so uh, so I had, uh, knowing that I was heading off to London, I asked if she'd like to, to join me. She was not able to get a work permit. Uh, she was not also to, you know, able to get a work permit to Australia, but I found my uh, and a, a way to come to the United States by going back to university and studying 
a course uh, in professional in our personal finance at, uh, at UCLA. And so I ended up uh, turning up and seeing my future boss in London and saying, uh, thanks for the opportunity, but I'm going to head off to America. And I packed up and you know, went around the world, landed up in Sydney and took off about a week later to, to head to the uh, shores of Los Angeles, thinking I'd be there for a, a year or two. And ended up, uh, I've now been in the States for just shy of 19 years and, and I'm a dual citizen. And I came here and I, I studied in personal finance. I thoroughly enjoyed it. But at the humble age of 24, I didn't think that uh, it made a lot of sense to ask people to trust me with their life savings when I'd barely seen, you know, two turns of the economy. So I knew I didn't want to be in personal finance, even though I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I, I knew I wanted to be back in sort of corporate finance in some capacity. So uh, Smith Barney was the company I was interning with at the time. They actually tried to hire me, and you know, we were actually out of H-1B visas. And I put my resume up on the, I think it was the PwC uh, alumni website. I got a call later on that day, and I was asked to go and interview at a, a small consulting firm that I'd never heard of. So I got this phone call, and I, I said, well, thanks for the opportunity, but I've never heard of your company. I'm, you know, I want to work for a company that's well-known. And, and, and the recruiter said, well, hold on. You know, this is a company that hires you know, only ex-Big Four alumni and or MBAs from top schools. We work with Fortune 1000 companies. And that was compelling. So I said, okay, let me hear you out. And I ended up going and interviewing with the, uh, the owner and CEO of the company, and he said, you know, while you're, you, know, you sound very capable and able to do you know, consulting and finance work, why don't you help me grow this company? And I didn't quite understand what that meant at the time, but I, I, I learned more and we decided to, uh, to work together. He said, what will it take? I said, well, we'll take you know, a bunch of paperwork and an investment in the visa. And he said, great, I'll make the investment, you do the paperwork. So I ended up joining this consulting firm and spent uh, the next 13 and a half years there. And that was a consulting firm focused on accounting and finance. And we ended up selling to private equity. And over the years, grew through market expansion. I was involved in all our major market expansions and bringing in new clients. And I ended up actually relocating to the Bay Area after eight and a half years in LA to lead our Bay Area practice and to grow that. And then subsequently ended up supporting two acquisitions for our company. And um, yeah, after 13 and a half years, I said that I've had probably enough time at this company. Things were evolving from a quality perspective that was a little different to my desired level of quality. And I, I thought it was time to take my next uh, period of time away from, from uh, corporate America and decided to take the year off. And I spent part of that year traveling through Western Europe with my my wife and my two children. And uh, in addition to that, I really honed in on the organization that I'd co-founded called the Board of Directors Center of Excellence, which is a organization, it's a member-based organization that focuses on, uh, essentially on ESG, which is environmental and social governance, and DE&I, diversity, equity, and inclusion, of corporate American boards. So we are, uh, my co-founder Paul and I decided that we wanted to make an impact on corporate boards, which were, which, which needed to have some composition changes in order to better represent the companies uh, that they were, you know, these boards were supporting and also their shareholders and also their customers. So one thing that really hit home is uh, someone with a daughter and a son and, and, and Paul has a, has a daughter is, our daughters didn't think the world was fair, and and sadly we we would we were in agreement with that. So a large part of what we do uh, with the board of directors, center of excellence, is is help to make sure that boards are properly composed with the right backgrounds and the right expertise, and the composition of those boards is a fair representation of the people that are the customers of a company, that are the employees of a company, and a representation of uh, of humanity in a more uh, appropriate manner. So that took me to the, and about 12 months after I departed my prior organization, I partnered with my current business partner, Patrick, and we, we co-founded uh, CFO's Domain, which is a place for CFOs and their stakeholders. We are an accounting and finance consulting and recruiting firm. Uh, we work with companies that are high growth, middle market, and Fortune 1000, helping them recruit and retain talent both on a full-time basis and in a consulting capacity. So 
hopefully that's uh, hopefully I wasn't uh, overly verbose in that <laughs> summary, and it uh, is a good uh, takes you from from where I was to where I am now. Oh, well, that, that's great. And let's actually start with CFO's domain. I want to definitely spend a bunch of time in the center of excellence, but from CFO's domain, knowing that you are, you know, finding CFOs, retaining CFOs, figuring out the right talent, CFOs have traditionally been a good jumping point to be on a board. Right? CEOs, CFOs are very, very common, but also for CFOs, perhaps someone um, in maybe getting that first big opportunity has to learn how to interact with the board and figure out where the line is and help board members maybe figure out where the line is about roles and responsibilities. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of these good, bad, and ugly sort of situations, and you're probably co- coaching some of them through how to do it. Give us a sense for a, you know, a seasoned advisor like yourself seeing these play out from the board member guidance perspective, right? So people listening to this show are either figuring out, I'm going to do this as a portfolio, I want to get many more board roles, or I'm getting my first one very soon. Figure out, help them to understand the CFO's role and how to support the CFO. Sure. So let me break that up into a few different pieces. So, uh, so I think the first part of that question was, how does a CFO uh, navigate the boardroom when they're not... Uh, when they're when they're not on the board themselves, right? So, uh, as a CFO, the, the first responsibility is is, you know, is to your fellow colleagues in executive management and your shareholders, and the shareholders are represented by that board. So, I, I think every good CFO needs to think about how do they be a strategic partner to the rest of the leadership team, not just the CEO, but all the key stakeholders in management, from marketing and sales to uh, compliance and legal to, uh, to the CEO and the COO. I think that the, the, the CFO should be helping people use the numbers to run the business and to be a great sounding board to them uh, in, doing, uh, in helping them take ideas and transforming them into sort of profitable ventures. Um, when it comes to the boardroom itself, the, again, I think having a, making sure you're in very strong alignment with your executive team is important. But at all times, everybody, all executive management, the CFO or otherwise, needs to be at the highest integrity possible. So the CFO has a very you know, important responsibility to present things uh, you know, in a manner that is both factual and, um, and supportive of sort of the goals of management and the shareholders they represent. Um, again, we're talking from a company, you know, public company environment. So there's, there's a variety of companies that where, where boards are impacted. So there's private equity portfolio companies. There are venture capital portfolio companies. There's public companies. There's private companies with, you know, with, with, with families at the, at the helm. And I think, again, the, the importance is how do, you, how do you work with the board to understand what is it they are seeking and how can you help them to have the information they need to know that you're sort of being successful. Does that help? Uh, yeah. Does that summarize some of the? Was there a second part that I? Well, that it's, I can it's a very helpful setup that? of the role, but I guess the other part of it is learning how to interact with the board in some ways. There are, for example, people who uh, land their first board seat often struggle with the idea of nose in, fingers out, of you are no longer the person who's being successful by doing. Now you're giving coaching and guidance and advice to senior management on strategy and different aspects, and some people struggle with where that line is, but where the board member's role isn't going too far into the operating space. And sometimes the CFO is a key person interacting with the board will be experiencing that. I'm sure you've seen some of your, your client organizations having that sort of trouble. And I wonder the guidance that you give them around that. Yeah, look, and, it's, and I think it's, it's a big dichotomy between what, what someone, a CFO might do for a not-for-profit versus for a private company board versus a public company board. And the differences in those organizations sometimes look to the board members to be more involved than, uh, than corporate governance thinks they should be. So the first thing I think of, that anyone in a board seat, but especially a CFO, needs to think about is, why do I want to be on this board? Why, why, not just why do I want to be a board member, why, why specifically should I take on this board seat opportunity? What am I doing how am I rounding out the composition of this board, okay? And what value can I bring? What expertise, industry, technical, um, you know, what, what am I doing to enhance the board? And what is the board looking, you know, what are they looking for me to be doing? If they're looking for me to be doing accounting and finance, you know, probably not the right opportunity. Then for me, in that I'm not the one that should be doing the day-to-day work, I should be Making sure and being, you know, helping the accountability of the existing team. So maybe I can take a board as audit committee chair, or 
you know, compensation committee chair. There's something where I have a certain set of expertise that allows me to be successful in, you know, driving corporate governance for the team. The other thing to think about is, should there be a crisis situation, how involved will I need to be? And 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 it's not necessarily that the, the CFO is going to be the one that has to step in, but they should be knowledgeable on what crisis management steps they might want to take to quickly bring in an interim person to help support uh, accounting or finance uh, or the audit committee in, in making sure the executive management is uh, is in a position to for the company to run by itself. So, again, having the discipline not to actually do the work, but to, to stand at that periphery and have a strong network, have uh, to be a guide, to be overlooking and, and keeping focused on uh, supporting the job that you were brought in to do versus the job that you might have done if you were in executive management. That makes sense. And we're, we're sort of heading there anyway, but let's let's dive into more of a, a focus on the boardroom space and clearly an opportunity to engage the side of your, your life that's focused on the Board of Director Center of Excellence. And if I were going to think about how to summarize that up for audience, I'd probably say it's a, it's a great entry point to exploring board seat opportunities. And this nonprofit organization is going to help its members you know, create a board profile, educate them on the basics of board governance, and probably connecting their members to people influential in board seat opportunities, which sounds like such a great fit for so many people listening to this show today. So tell us more about, about how that works and maybe what one of the journey is for one of your members. Sure. So... When we, when we created the Board of Directors Center of Excellence, like I said, we wanted to have a positive influence on corporate um, boards in America and eventually internationally so that there is a greater emphasis on diversity, equity, and inclusion and, and environmental and social governance. Uh, and as you will, you know, for those of you who listen to earnings calls, you will hear more and more questions asked in earnings calls around these two topics, right? When... Um, and so, so the emphasis and the you know the focus on this needs to increase. Um, for the folks who are for people who are looking to move into board seat opportunities, first they need to ask themselves why and make sure that the answer makes sense for them. Do they really want to be involved in board seat op, you know, roles? Because it comes with a, a large amount of responsibility. So knowing that you really want to be taking that on, and you could be involved in legal matters, you can be involved in corporate compliance matters to know what you're getting into and to make sure you have mastered your craft like anything before you dive into something, uh, it, it pays to educate yourself. So read books, read publications, read forums, potentially go and seek out a, a board level education at one of the uh, one of the universities that offers corporate governance programs or uh, something which will give you a credential to perhaps uh, differentiate you from other people that are seeking board seat opportunities that are that are highly competitive field. So make sure you want to be a board person, a board member, number one. Two, educate yourself to make sure you're armed with the information you need to know to know what your role and responsibilities are. Make sure you have checked in on what directors and officers insurance uh, protects you and, and what you're protected against and what you're not protected against. Uh, know the company really well. So uh, any board member should be interviewing the company and the board as much as the company and board should be interviewing them, okay? Uh, make sure you have the time to dedicate. Understand what that time needs to be. So it's not just turning up to the four board meetings and, you know, reading a little bit, you know, just prior. It's, there is a material investment in time and being knowledgeable, tracking the company, understanding the company, sometimes understanding the industry and the competitive landscape, um, and being familiar with you know, the topic that you might be asked to be most involved in during a crisis management situation. So the Board of Directors Center of Excellence, what we do is we, we help, A, we have an educational program that gives you a synopsis of the corporate governance landscape that you need to learn. We also help you to convert your resume into a board profile. Again, a resume talks about work that you're able to do from a hands-on perspective. A board profile talks about how you can parlay those, those skills from uh, the executive team into the boardroom and where you can be at your highest and best use. We also connect people with influences around board seat opportunities. So those are the three key things we do. So we help on the education side, we help with connections, and we help create a board profile. Uh, we also help people to understand that 
in order to get a board seat, one of the most important things you need to do is make sure your network knows that you want a board seat. If people don't know that you want a board seat, then they may not know to think of you. Right. Then you need to make their target even easier for them to see. Another area to be thinking about when you're seeking a boardroom opportunity is what are you an expert in? Is it, 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 and, and a board should be seeking you out much more for an industry expertise versus a functional expertise. For example, you might be a great CFO, but a company can hire a CFO. What you might be is you might be a great CFO that spent 30 years in a specific industry where your depth of knowledge in that industry is going to be valuable from a M&A perspective, from a recruitment and retention perspective, from a revenue generation perspective. These are the areas where you can sort of have awareness and knowledge and bring an impact. So that industry depth is really important. And if you're really interested in being a board member, like anything that if you seek, you should make that agenda uh, something you focus on. So many, many, many meetings with people that are directly relevant to the size of company that you would be best suited to be a board member for, the industry of that company, whether that company is or organization is public, private, or a not-for-profit, the location of that company, and talk to the people that are in and around those companies, other executives of those types of companies, other board members, valuable service providers, including uh, recruiting and consulting firms, including law firms, including investment banks, commercial banks, all of these, all of the organizations that are connected to and will hear about opportunities for board seats. And you can leave them behind with the, uh, the message of, I want to be a, you know, I'm a, I'm a, consumer product industry expert with a background in finance. Uh, I would like to be a board member for a other private or public company uh, in consumer products between 50 million and 250 million. That's my target and that's where I think I'm going to make the most impact. And leaving people with a target they can see is one of the most important things uh, that you can do to get a board seat. So these are some of the concepts that we teach um, our members of the Board of Directors Centre of Excellence, and we put on events where other board members present and talk about their journey into the boardroom, their journey on the board, and why, you know, what they've learned from prior boards, problems they avoided, uh, opportunities that, you know, they wish they had taken, and opportunities mm. they're thankful they didn't take. So it's, it's helping people to navigate uh, a marathon-like journey, which is often what's needed uh, from a mindset perspective to get a board seat uh, and to keep it and to thrive in it. I think that last line is very important because I think we all romanticize the idea that the stars might align, it might happen very quickly, and we do hear about those stories. We've had a couple on this podcast, but they're not the norm, right? They're certainly exceptional for a variety of reasons, and it is a, a long game that you're playing also because you want to make sure you're putting yourself into the right position, not just the first board position that comes up. And before the podcast started today, the recording, you and I were talking about that an opportunity you have today that you're weighing about whether that's something you should do. And maybe we can spend a little time on your own personal board journey because you've been on some high profile organizations yourselves. You've had to make the decisions about there's only so many hours in the day. Where do I spend my time? Perhaps you can share a bit of that with our audience. Sure. So I've, I've been predominantly a board member of not-for-profit organizations and I plan to continue to do that. I also plan on taking on um, a private uh, board opportunity um, that will be yeah, for a, for a for-profit organization. And then over time, a public company opportunity. So, on the not-for-profit side, I like the like the idea of giving back, and I've I spent uh, I've been on boards for several different organisations, from Australian Professional Networks to a very well-known um, conservation and zoological society, and I re which I recently stepped down from after my my three-year term. And although I was asked to continue on, um, a, a fair bit of heavy lifting was required in the the last year due to COVID. Uh, in that organization, and it, it took time away from other things I was doing, and I had a huge responsibility. So having gone through that experience, it, um, it made me realize that I need to be, you know, knowing, I, I need to know that I, it's important to know when you need to take a break from an organization or from, an op from the responsibility of being a board member so that you can rededicate that time, whether it's to your, your business or your family or your other interests. Uh, 
Uh, I am evaluating another much larger not-for-profit organization with about a $100 million annual uh, budget. And as I think about that opportunity, I am making sure that I, I spend the time I need to to understand what, you know, where I'll be at my highest and best use, what the organization will need from me, where I can make the most contribution. And I want to get to know the board members. And it's an organization that is international, um, and I, it will require international travel. It will require um, working closely with large corporations uh, to get them involved and you know, also working closely with probably government agencies. So I'm, a, I'm, I'm evaluating that opportunity in conjunction with some private company opportunities where I want to make sure I have time to, uh, I want to make sure I have the right amount of time to dedicate to do all the different things that I'm, I'm working on from running my, from running CFO's domain to continuing to grow the Board of Directors Center of Excellence to spending adequate time and you know on my own personal fitness and health and being with my family and my friends who I you know who I which is part of the reason I work as hard as I do is for the you know is, is to spend that time and to be with my family and friends so I want to make sure I don't bite off more than I can chew and I, I, I think that should an opportunity for a for-profit board likely for a private equity portfolio company come along or a venture capital portfolio company I will probably think of that opportunity more seriously now because I do want to eventually sit on a, a, a number of uh, boards where I can make a difference and I can have a both a um, both make a difference to the shareholders uh, as well as potentially participate in the growth of that company where I can be in an advisory capacity and a board capacity versus in hands-on management and be able to financially um, benefit from that time investment. And so maybe this is a really good point to take a little bit step further into what I'll call due diligence. So you're, you're talking about it at a high level now, and I think this is something that many people struggle with, especially as they're going for their first board opportunity of how do I figure out if it's the right opportunity? And again, there's a very different amount of information available from different types, say public versus private, et cetera. But having done this yourself before and also helped some of your clients do this, what advice do you give to someone? Let's say you were just talking about so private equity companies, right? How would someone go about assessing an opportunity at a private company? Because there are so many more opportunities for private company board seats than there are for public. What is the guidance and advice that either you'd be using yourself or you'd be giving to maybe someone who's a member of the Center of Excellence? It's to, it's to know what you want and why you want it and to know where you are truly going to be uh, going to make a difference. So if you've got, if you've been, and if you have worked with private equity, either as a portfolio company or as executive management, and you understand who they are, what they do, and why they're doing it, and to understand the nuances of a private equity opportunity versus a not-for-profit versus a public company, you should focus your time and energy where you know you are going to be more knowledgeable. So if you've never been in a public company setting, to think that the best board seat opportunity for you is going to be some large public company is, is probably um, it's probably a little naive, quite frankly. So I think that like anything, you're taking on a new career. No one starts at the you know at the you know, CEO of a Fortune 500 company in their career. They start small and they grow and they have discipline and they continue to educate themselves and building their knowledge and network. So often the trajectory can be starting off in a in a not-for-profit capacity, while you're in, you know, working your way up into the uh, uh, into the board, in, into executive management, into the C-suite, and then when you're in the C-suite, taking on, you know, looking for an opportunity that's non, you know, that doesn't conflict with what you're doing, obviously, and where you have a set of expertise that you could go and help a private company, and then again with that continued board expertise, think about parlaying that opportunity into a public company setting or perhaps you're with a private company that goes public and then you get some public company expertise and it might be small high growth experience it might be mid-cap experience so it's again knowing who you are knowing what your skill set is continuously adapting and growing your knowledge set and understanding do you like the public company scrutiny do you not like that do you like the uh, you know, the pros and cons of a, of a, of a private company uh, setting so it's really about knowing yourself and putting yourself in a place where you're going to be happy and you're going to be able to make a positive difference. 
I like that. Let me just pick up on a thread you were talking there about, say, the scrutiny that comes from being a public company. And we were talking about this at the very beginning of the show when you were describing, say, the center of excellence and how you're trying to move the needle in certain spaces, such as DEI and ESG. And ESG is such an interesting one because anybody can say those letters and mean entirely different things, whether it varies by industry or company, even people within a boardroom knowing different backgrounds and experiences. So when you look at the future of the boardroom, and I, I say this knowing that you're trying to intentionally make some changes and you're trying to make a mark in a positive way. Way. What do you think the future of the boardroom is going to look like? I think the future of the boardroom is going to be, again, I think that corporate boards need to involve to be a much closer representation of their customers and their shareholders and the environments in which they operate and impact. So there will be a far greater push for sustainability, for climate, you know, climatic impacts, for gender equality, for wealth gap equality, these are going to become things that that society will demand of companies and therefore the boards are going to have to adapt to and think about in order to make sure that brands are, are able to grow profitably. If they do things in a, in a manner that society doesn't, that, that, that is negative to society, then society is going to react, whether that's a consumer-facing buyer or it's a government buyer or it's a enterprise buyer. The, the, at the end of the day, people dollars will go to where people believe um, they should be going. And if the com- companies and organizations are going to be held far more accountable as time goes on to do the right thing, there is far more awareness around these topics. It's overdue. It's required. And you're going to see, in my, I, I am of the view that boardrooms are going to look and feel much, are going to have a much more focused representation of the shareholders and the customers of, a, of an organization versus what they look like today. And I yes, I'd put employees in there and, and several, several other categories as well, right? It's going to change from just what the picture in the annual report of a public company looks like to being assessed in many different ways. And Rahul, we are so glad to hear about the great work that you are doing about preparing people to be successful board members, about trying to change the conversation in the boardroom. Thank you for all your hard work and for giving us your insights and helping everyone on this show today to be more boardroom bound. That's it for this episode of Boardroom Bound. I really enjoyed chatting with Rahul Marani, especially about how he shared that the Board of Directors Center of Excellence about how they're working to to move the needle, to change things in the boardroom. You think about ESG and DEI, how they're educating their members to be well-prepared to give us a great example of how you give an elevator pitch about yourself so that the people in your network know that you want to be on a board with a specific type of opportunity that you're looking for. Now remember to head over to podcast.gordon.edu where you can get all the links to today's resources. And please know that the Boardroom Bound team and I are so proud to be your go-to podcast for all things that connect, prepare, and empower you to land the board seat. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and miss any of the high-quality content that we're bringing to you every Wednesday. Thanks for joining me today. I can't wait to share more stories and strategies from brilliant business minds with you again next week. Remember to keep tuning in to be Boardroom Bound. <laughs>